what uh, what the scripture is teaching about this certain area. Um, but I, I got to tell you that I, I really have enjoyed this. is just a very very practical, easy, everyday book that you can man you can put it to work in your life just right away. And so um, I like it for that reason. And I I uh, wanted to just tell you that. Um, Prayer is, is critical to everything we're all about. Um, I think we all know that. Um, I'm human just like all of you, and I, I continually need to remind myself prayer is, is everything about the life of the church. I mean, it really is. It's, um, it, it's a deal breaker. The church that is, is fervent in prayer is the church that is effective and um, so even um, last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday, and, and we're, uh, I think it's perfect that we're, we're continuing this focus on the altar. This last week was sort of an Old Testament idea of what the altar was, moving towards the New Testament model of the altar this week. But we had wonderful ministry in the altar Sunday. This Sunday, I would like you to, um, to know ahead of time that I'm setting aside, I think, uh, I think I'm going to say it this way, though the Holy Spirit might lead me differently, but during our service, um, there's going to be just a segment where, where we pray, and uh, just as a congregation, not, not singing, um, not talking or teaching, but just that we as a congregation would pray together. And I'm thinking probably not unless the Holy Spirit has more time in mind, but I'm, I'm thinking let's set aside five minutes to just during this next five minutes of the service, let's seek God together just with audible expressions of praise. And, and uh, I'm, I'm also just um, prompting you to be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit that if the Holy Spirit wants to display spiritual gifts during our gatherings. Um, we're a Pentecostal church. We believe in the, we believe the spiritual gifts and uh, um, often the Lord will have something to say to us that um, it can happen in just in one moment the Holy Spirit can do the work that two years of counseling could not do. I mean, just, just to be in His presence um, and, and you're looking at a guy that believes in counseling. I mean, I, I thank God for the administrative gifts. Uh, that's there's there is one um, one of the New Testament spiritual gifts that sort of the the old English word administrations is the idea of of the the modern counselor. It's one of the gifts of, of the Lord to us. The, the person who has the ability to hear and to listen and to draw out. It's one of the spiritual gifts. But um, I want you to know I believe in the moving of the Spirit. I'm praying that, that Sunday will be a day when the Holy Spirit just absolutely pours out um, his presence upon us. I'm, I've been asking, Lord, let it just be like a blanket that settles upon us, that is felt like it, I don't know, if, I'm not even sure if I have the words, but you can tell when you've been in the presence of the Lord. So I just want, I want to prompt you, please be praying for Sunday and come expecting God to meet with us in a, a, a special way. Well, tonight we're, we're wrapping up uh, Praying with Confidence. I've got this one word prompt up here. Um, I, I want to ask for your help. Tell me, um, and, and don't get biblical yet. Don't start spewing scripture at me. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just, I'm asking the word fruit. What does fruit mean to you? What? What are some words that could be like fruit? What could it be like? And and what are any qualities at all that you think of when you think of fruit? Okay? Oh boy, that's wide open, isn't it? <laughs> 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 Results. 
Results. Oh my goodness, you cheated and went to the end of the book, didn't you? <laughs> Actually, that's the, that is the very word that I was wanting to drive to. But you can tell somebody it's got the fruit of the Spirit because they already know. All right, so, but what, what else? What else could, results? That's one, one word. Nutrition. Nutrition. Wow. Spoken as a true nurse. <laughs> yeah, she had to, had to bring that nutrition thing into the conversation. <laughs> That's wonderful. What else? What else? Sweet. Sweet, yes, fruit is sweet. Oh my goodness. And refreshing. And refreshing. Okay. There to me there's nothing better than on a hot day a nice cold juicy orange. I love mm. so refreshing. So yummy. What what else? Anything else? Okay, I'm going to put one up here. Byproduct. That's one I'm fond of saying. When I think of fruit, I'm thinking. What, what, is, what is fruit? What are some of the characteristics of fruit? What, what is inside fruit usually? A seed. Oh, see, okay. With a little bit of prompting. Okay, what, what else? Any, anything come to mind? Hey, by the way, is this a singular word or a plural word? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, so it, it can be either, can't it? I mean, sometimes we say fruit, and we mean, look at that basket of fruit. And there's, or sometimes we say, um, that apple is a piece of fruit. Okay, that's... It can be singular or plural. Sometimes we say fruit, sometimes we say fruits. Um, now, that's true in the English language. Fruit, we, we have difficulty distinguishing between singular and plural because it could fit with any context. But the New Testament was written in Greek. So here's, here's something really profound. In the Greek language, it's the same way. <laughs> fruit of the Spirit. Fruits of the Spirit. It's just, it's plural, but it, it's, yeah. Any other thoughts? Any other thoughts about fruit? It's beautiful. It's be oh, beautiful, yes. Oh, my goodness, John. I mean, I was, just the other day, I think I commented actually in, one of the sermons yeah. about opening an orange you go, this is amazing. It's a, a ready-made meal. It's like pre-packaged. You just open up, you eat it on the run. But, but it's beautiful. All the colors. Oranges, apples, bananas. I mean, bright different colors. Grapes. Uh, any other? Any Sumptuous. Others? What was it? Sumptuous. Sumptuous. Now you're really testing my spelling skills. <laughs> I'll tell you, here's, here's what she just said. Something. I don't know what she said. <laughs> sumptuous, I'm going to try. Is it, is it this? Is it sumptuous? Like that? Sumptuous. That looks good. <laughs> My wife won the spelling bee in school, and she often reminds me of that, too. <laughs> All right, sumptuous is such a good word. Oh my goodness, fruit is sumptuous. Uh, so when Paul was trying to describe what it's like for a person to be inhabited by the Holy Spirit of God, he says, ah, oh, I've got the perfect word. The fruit of the Spirit. Now, when, when, we, when we think of fruit, look at all the things that we came up with. The results, the nutrition, the sweetness, refreshing, byproduct, seed, beautiful, sumptuous. Um, I, was, I was thinking of this this morning. Um, I went to uh, our center piece. I don't know. Stephanie has a basket on the table. And, and uh, we, we had three apples left there. And I was going to get an apple. But I waited too long. I picked it up. Oh no, it went bad on me. Oh, there's nothing worse than 
than fruit that's spoiled. I mean, when it's, it's like, ugh, toss it, and then you kind of feel like, oh, what a waste. That was wonderful fruit. Or bananas, I love bananas, but you know, if they hang there too long, I was. I think I was having a conversation with you, Craig, about the little gnats. What's the thing? Oh yeah. Yeah, you gotta yeah. watch as the little gnats come start flying around. You know. But, um, well, what was your your rule of thumb? What did you? I do? just. I said in summer you gotta change the garbage. Uh, you can't last much longer than three days. Three day, Every three days, change out the garbage yeah. during the summertime <laughs> here in Arizona. Um, well, so uh, and the other. I guess if I were to think of a negative about fruit, um, the gospel teaches that by their fruits you will know them, whether they're good fruit or bad fruit. Um, you don't, well, I'm, I'm doing this is the danger of doing this off the cuff, you don't pick grapes from thorns, is that, am I, what, what is the wording of the scripture text? You know the one I'm thinking of. Somebody help me. Some of you great theologians. Anyways, you you will know a tree by the fruit it bears. If it's a good fruit, if it's a good tree, it's going to bear good fruit. Likewise, if it's a bad tree, it's going to bear bad fruit. So, as believers in the Lord, if if someone were to come up to your spiritual fruit tree and and examine your fruit. Okay, you didn't get any prep on this at all, just right now. Oh, no, here's the examiner. How well would you do? Be honest with it. That's kind of scary, isn't it? It's scary for me. Woo, you mean you might actually examine my fruit to see how I'm doing. Um, so, what happens in... Um, and by the way, we're, we're leading up to one of the prayer sessions that Jeff Leak um, admonishes us in, in the book, Praying with Confidence. But what happens in Galatians chapter 5 is that there's this comparison of fruit. Let's say it this way. There's bad fruit. And there's good fruit. Um, we might say it this way. There is the fruit of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. Now, interestingly, um, he doesn't use the word fruit when he's talking about the flesh. But it's definitely speaking of all the indicators, all the byproduct, all the results of the flesh. The results of the flesh versus the results of the spirit. By the way, who, who wrote Galatians? Paul. Paul. Paul wrote Galatians. And and am I right? Did he also write the book of Romans? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Oh, ho. Oh. Okay, so then let's... For a moment then, before we get to this, let's look at Romans chapter 8. Romans, you could think of, of it as Paul's Magna Carta. It's his, I mean, it's his masterpiece, really. Um, so verses 5 through 8. And I, I'm reading tonight from New American Standard. It reads like this. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. For it is not a, even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So, 
Paul makes this comparison between flesh and spirit. And I want you to notice how, how he words it. He, he doesn't say, oh, well, you were born this way. You have certain inclinations, and that's just the way you are. No. He says, you set your mind in a direction. Mm -hmm. The one who sets their mind on the things of the flesh will crave the things of the flesh. The one who sets their mind on spiritual things will be uh, lending themselves to things of the spirit. So Paul is very familiar with this whole idea of bad versus good. Um, now, uh, we're going to read from Galatians chapter 5. And by the way, if, if you struggle with remembering the order of the books in the New Testament, um, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, I always get those right. You know why? Because I had a Bible uh, teacher, Pastor Z, a Bible college professor one time, told me, Gentiles eat pork chops. I've never forgotten. G E P C. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Okay, so that comes from the that comes from the for what it's worth department. Okay. Um, Galatians five. Now, starting at verse sixteen, he makes this same statement. But I say. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Um, I, I wanted to reword that. The Keith Howard version would be, Walk by the Spirit, and you'll never have any struggles with the flesh. But it doesn't say that. <laughs> now, if, if I were the one writing the Bible, well, that's what I would have said. Walk by the Spirit, and all that stuff just goes away. But what does it say? Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. You can't exit from this flesh. This is your earth suit until you get to heaven. I mean, you live with it, and every day you have to kick it to the curb, so to speak. You have to tell this flesh you will follow spiritual things. Um, you know, Have you noticed, I don't know if your flesh is any like mine, but you don't even have to tell your flesh to be fleshly. It's quite good at it. <laughs> But you do have to tell yourself, no, I will uh, be spiritual. And there was a story, I've told it before. Uh, I'm told this was a, a true story, but I don't, I don't know, I mean, how things get handed down. But the, the legend was that up in Alaska, there was this old um, miner that would come to town every weekend, and he would always bring dogs, and they would fight, and he would take bets on the dogs. And um, he always won a lot of money. And he always knew which dog was going to win. And uh, so finally somebody got onto it and figured out what he was doing. Three days before the battle, he would stop feeding one of the dogs. And then come Friday night, when they would get into the fight, the dog that had not been fed got whipped. And then he'd let them lick their wounds and heal up for the next seven days. And then three days before the next fight, I'm looking at a dog lover. I know how much this is painful to show him. He would uh, he'd do the same thing. Whichever dog he didn't feed would lose. And it's the same way with your flesh and your spirit. The, the dog that you feed is going to win. If you feed your flesh... With music and television and computer and just, and by the way, all of that's great, all that's good stuff. But monitor carefully the gateways of your heart. Monitor it continually because the one that gets fed is the one that's going to win. If you feed your spirit, your spirit man will rise up. But if you starve your spirit and you feed your flesh, then don't be surprised when your flesh is always winning. That's just, I, I know that from my life and I bet you do too. So here's what he says in Galatians 5, verse 17, where we left off. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Verse 18, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. And he's talking to people that that believed you needed to obey the tenets of the Old Testament law. 
they had been told by people, look, if you're going to follow Jesus, that means, sure, that's good, but you can't stop with the animal sacrifices, and you can't stop observing the 613 tenets of Torah. You have to fulfill all, every letter of the law. And so Paul was writing to them to say, that's, that's not right. We are in Christ by faith. And, um, and so live by the Spirit. So you're not under, you're no longer under law. That doesn't mean that you just take the Old Testament and throw it out, baby, with the bathwater. No. But it means that the Old Testament is fulfilled by the New Testament. Now, the interesting things that he says in verse number 19. And depending on which version of Scripture you have in front of you, uh, it might be worded a little bit differently, but we're just going to take a moment and, and write these down. It says, uh, now the deeds of the flesh are evident. The fruit of the flesh is evident. The deeds, the byproducts, the results of the flesh, say it a number of different ways, it's evident. And he names them for us. He says, Immorality, impurity, and sensuality. Let's put those down first. Uh, sensuality, was it? Um, just for, for those that are really wanting to think carefully about just what word you, because you'll hear it worded in different language, or different versions, it'll be worded a little bit differently. But the immorality that's spoken of here, um, um, I'm trying to think specifically of the uh, King James word fornication. The word fornication that is here translated immorality um, specifically means sex outside of marriage. That is what that word means. Uh, sensuality has to, uh, impurity has to do with being very debased, not just, um, you know, not just sinful, but it, very immoral and very debased and just uh, uh, very, just going low as you can go. And sensuality, all three of these are really grouped together, um, just has to do with, with um, not having any guard upon your sexual activity. Just being very open and very promiscuous, we would say. Just um, uh, so immorality, impurity, sensuality. And then he goes on to say idolatry, sorcery. Let's put those together. Um, some of the translations use the word witchcraft. Uh, idolatry, witchcraft. But this has to do with crossing lines into spiritual dimensions and uh, maybe giving it into uh, saying mantras and chanting things and, and getting involved with, with actual casting of spells and things like that. Then he says, uh, enmities and strife. And, and the word enmities is, is really getting at hostility, like real hatred. Some, some translations will have hatred, just hateful. Um, do you know anybody like that? I do. I mean, I know some, yeah, that they're just very hostile. And, oh, angry. By the way, same word that Paul used earlier when we were reading from Romans chapter 8 about hostilities. Okay, and uh, just reading on here, um, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger. Um, and then uh, after that he says, um, Disputes, dissensions, factions, envying. So, boy, I don't know if I'm going to be able to write all of these on here to fit on here, but this is getting at someone who is just simply argumentative. I don't know if you know anyone like this, but you, you can't even have conversation with them 
Because every single thing that you say, it doesn't matter what it is, they're going to disagree with it and be combative and come at you uh, from a different, you know, just out of resentment. And, and that's kind just of what this is up. talking about here. So uh, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying. Um, Drunkenness, carousing, so you kind of picture somebody as just, I, I was reading one of the newer uh, translations of scripture this afternoon, studying for this, and, and it was basically, I can't remember if it used this word, but it talked about basically a party animal. Someone is just always living to party, just out carousing, having having a good time. By the way, I don't I don't get it. The people that I that I've talked with who have a good time on the weekends, boy, come Monday morning they're just like dragging so bad, you know, oh, a headache, man, I'm hurting. What's wrong with you? Oh man, I had so much fun this weekend. Did you really? I mean, is it fun? Because it seems to me you don't even you can't even be at work today, you know. But but all of these things now, if, if you were to count them, I don't know if I got all of them, but I counted this afternoon 15 things that Paul listed on the bad fruit side, on the fleshly fruit side. But then if, if you look on the other side, then he says, starting at verse 22, he, he tells us the good things. And uh, he says, but, and, and uh, the New Revised Standard Version, let me just speak to this for a moment. Um, in terms of translations of Scripture, most seminaries used, uh, used the New Revised Standard Version. Why is that? Is it because they're saying it's better? No, not for that reason. But if you want to know what is the, the closest, like most accurate, just coming across taking the language from Greek into the English language, um, what would be the closest actual? Probably, probably New Revised Standard Version would be right up there. And then um, the New American Standard is a close second. There's several. But to get into that discussion, it, it sounds like that that's saying that those are better translations. It's not what I'm saying. Because translators have all kinds of issues when they're trying to bring it, just try to imagine, bringing it from one language into another language. So it's the, the beauty of NRSV, NAS, it gives you as best possible a word-for-word -word translation. The problem is that sometimes it can be very wooden and it will come out in ways that we wouldn't speak it. So on the other end of the spectrum, there's this school of thought that says, well, let's take dynamics of language and let's try to say, okay, how would we say that in English? Well, then you might get into all kinds of idioms and phrases that we recognize and we go, oh, I can relate to that. Thank you for making it easier. But the drawback of doing it that way is you're, you're scooting further away from the actual word for word. So you, I mean, translators, they've got a big task to try to figure out how to, to put it into our language. But um, in, in, in the uh, New Revised Standard, when it makes the switch from bad to good, it's more than what we have. Um, uh, for instance, what I'm reading here, verse number 22 starts off this. New Revised Standard, I don't have it in front of me, but it's something similar to this. However, in contrast to that, the fruit of the Spirit is. I mean, it would be a big stop. It would be, on the other hand, and that's, that's really, I think, what Paul was trying to do. He said, here's the fruit of, uh, of the flesh, but here's the fruit of the Spirit. And let's list the fruit of the Spirit. By the way, is it fruit of Spirit or fruits of Spirit? Fruit. 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 Okay. But what does fruit mean? Is it one or nine? <laughs> it's, it's singular, plural, all at the same time. So if somebody wants to argue and say, well, it's talking about fruit of the Spirit, not fruits of the Spirit, I'm just telling you that's, 
that argument just goes in circles. It, you'll never figure it out, okay? So, um, the, the fruit of the Spirit, all right, so it, he lists love, joy, peace. And again, depending on which translation, you're going to see it worded a little bit differently. Patience, kindness, goodness. Passion. Okay, and, and then faithfulness, gentle self-control. Go right ahead, Richard. Long suffering. Yeah, I think it, it. I think you're exactly right. And um, patience doesn't quite capture what he he meant. He, he meant putting up with a lot, didn't he? I mean, do you want to say any more to that? If you didn't hear what Richard just said, um, the old King James has long suffering instead of this word patience. Speak to that for a moment. That's really good. It just simply, it's more descriptive. Mm -hmm. You can be patient if it's not hurting. When mm. it starts hurting, it's hard to be patient. I um, I wrote a song, a worship chorus in I think it was 2001. I haven't thought of it in a long time. I'm thinking of it today. I want to know you in your grace and in your suffering. I want to know, no, I want to know you in your joy and in your suffering. I want to know you in your grace and in your groan. I want to know you when my faith demands surrender. I want to know you till my life is not my own. Um, it, it's taken, obviously, from Paul's words about knowing him in, in great, yeah, in Philippians. Um, <laughs> And so that's, what, 17, 18 years ago now. Uh, this afternoon, I had a conversation with the Lord. And it was, um, do you remember that song you wrote? Oh, yeah. I remember singing that so passionately. Did you mean it? Oh, I think back over the years. Ooh, I never saw some of the things coming that were around the bend. I, I hope I meant it. I think I meant it. I really do, but that, that's so true. It's, you know, patience is one of those things that it's easy to be patient when it doesn't hurt. But long-suffering. What I would like to do, and again, it's kind of hard because, see, I, there's nine over here. There's 15 over here. Us Americans, we don't like that. We're supposed to have nine on each side or 15 on each side. How are we going to equal those out and balance them out? But the Greek mind doesn't think that way. It's more conceptual. And, and there's somewhere in this um, scripture where Paul says, and things like this, or and such things. He's not meaning to say, here's a complete and final exhaustive total list. But he's saying there's spiritual, there's fleshly things and there's spiritual things. And he's trying to bring out the contrast between the two, that they are so different, flesh from the spirit. Um, one of the things that I noticed right away, so in this list he says immorality, impurity, sensuality. I mean, honestly, don't you know people that that's what they live for? Watch American television. I mean, the stuff that, that gets in front of our eyes so easily. Um, I'm, I'm learning more and more to master the power of the off button. The channel changer. 
I've decided for our home, there are certain things we will not allow in. We, we're not going to, that gateway, it's not going to come in. And, and uh, one of the things that is so pervasive, we were talking about television commercials even before church tonight, uh, Pete and I, and it wasn't even about this topic. He was talking about um, the concept of marriage, how it is being taken out of some of the commercials and the words that are in, uh, changing like a, he was talking about a Ford commercial that talks about um, this these three different SUVs this small one is for when you move in together oh Chevy not Ford oh that's right yeah he's a Ford guy okay I just I opened a can of words right now there's this ongoing battle between Ford and Chevy and never the twain shall meet and I don't know where Dodge falls out on all of this okay but but my comment to him was, have you noticed, if I'm waiting for one mattress company to not use the word partner, but instead use the word spouse yeah. on their advertising. But we, we can, and this, this is really something that's uh, crawling under my skin, is that in America in 2018, when there is this collusion of an effort to tell all of us, and it's been on for decades, homosexuality is normal. Homosexuality is normal. Homosexuality is normal. Over and over. Now, do you know in recent months, I've seen more and more advertisings, uh, advertisements of lesbian kisses on TV. <laughs> on commercials for, for G-rated programming. Yeah. Okay. Or the Pope telling a homosexual man that God made him that way. Yeah. yeah. And and um, the Pope loves you the way you are made, and God made you this way. Yeah. Uh, and it, this is a whole other area, but this is a real concern of Catholic doctrine that the Scripture. Um, is what orders our belief, but I don't know if, if you know this, but the Pope, if he speaks something, it is equal to Scripture. And the College of the Cardinals, and if the magistrates say something, then, then that carries the weight of Scripture. And there haven't been a lot of times throughout church history where there's been real, real serious disagreement. But that's a serious, serious disagreement. Um, so, but on this side, Paul says love, and I'm sure you could, you know, you could compare several of them, but fruit of the flesh is immorality and impurity and sensuality, but if you want to know what real love is, and this, this is not, by the way, the Greek word for sexual love, and there is one, but this is, this is speaking of uh, familial love, just love, true, pure love that's not selfish. Um, Look, look at this, gentleness, rather than, look over here, strive, outbursts of anger, disputes, factions. Um, we're, we're kind of getting low on time, and I'm going to kind of wrap it up, but you, you could do a lot with this list. Look at this. Self-control is the fruit of the Spirit versus drunkenness, carousing. And I don't think that Paul means to beat us up. I think what he's saying is if we could just understand what's available to us, if, if the Spirit of God is in us, how it changes every part of our lives. Now, um, we've taken the scenic route to get there, but I, I want to close with, with Jeff's prayer. By the way, we're not going to have time to do this, but I had thought we would also pray uh, a couple of them that are past days 30 and 31. Uh, there's a couple I want to point out to you. Family prayer. Uh, what page is that? 126, family prayer. That is a powerful prayer to pray over your family. And then um, 
This one, a life transformation prayer, I thought that was really, really powerful. Here's some things that you can declare regarding your life and your situation and, and, uh, and, and your livelihood. And that's on page 124. Um, yeah, uh, Paulette, did you have an observation? Yeah, I did. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the we're talking about balance sheets, and I think Galatians 5, verse 24, sort of balance brings everything balanced. Mm -hmm. And it says, and those who belong to to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passion and desires. Excellent. And I think that balances everything. It it absolutely does. That's that's I love your wording on that. That's that is the equalizer, isn't it? I mean that just really brings balance. So those who are in Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Um, let's look at in your book page uh, what is it page ninety nine, praying the fruits of the spirit. And there are nine different focuses, uh, and it, it takes us through the fruit of the Spirit. I, I, we're not going to pray all the way through this, but just to describe what, what you could do. Lord, birth goodness in me today. I wanted to uh, point out, you know, we were describing all of these, um, these words for what fruit is. Um, I think we said results. That was the one I thought of. Same one that Pat was saying. And um, uh, outcomes and on and on we went. But the word that, um, that Jeff Lee likes the most is birth. And I think that kind of ties into that idea that there's seed and fruit. And fruit takes, takes the seed takes root and it springs forth into life. And uh, he's praying for each one of these areas. Lord, birth goodness in me today. There's some scripture from Romans 8, 28 and 29. Second focus, Lord, birth faithfulness in me today. John 15, 1 through 9 is all about abiding in the vine. Remember that one? Uh, Lord, birth love in my life today. He uses Ephesians 3. Um, Lord birth infectious joy. I like that. Infectious joy in my life today. Um, I choose joy even in trials because you are using these things to make me mature, complete, and lacking nothing. Focus five. Lord birth peace in my life today. And of course he uses that hallmark verse, Philippians chapter 4, 6, and 7, the peace of God that passes all understanding. Uh, focus six. Lord birth patience in my life today. Um, as Jesus prayed, I pray now, not my will, but yours be done. Uh, focus seven, Lord, birth kindness in my life today. Forgive me, Lord, for any words, attitudes, actions that have been unkind. Uh, focus eight, Lord, birth self-control in my life today. Um, I declare that you're able to set me free from habits of the past. I renounce and put to death the old ways and choose to live for you. And then the last one, focus nine, Lord, birth meekness and gentleness in my life today. Um, he uses Matthew 5, 8, I declare your promise that as I yield my rights to you, you will move heaven and earth on my behalf. I yield control to you over all of my life. Um, so again, this is, um, you know, these are just some tools to help us in our walk with God. I want to just close by having a prayer that the fruit of the Spirit will be given place to um, to grow in our lives. Um, I, I read a book one time by a guy named Carlos Guerrero, and uh, he talks about in it how that um, an apple cannot ripen by squinting its eyes and tightening up <laughs> and trying to get ripe. Um, we can't do that either. I mean, the, you can't, you know, there's no fast track. The thing I know about the fruit of the Spirit, it's there's seasons in our lives. And the way that, that the way to grow love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, long suffering, goodness, faithfulness, self control, 
is to just fall in love with Jesus. And over time, these things take up root inside us and they just start to grow and grow and grow. Um, this would be a whole other discussion. But the difference between the gifts of the Spirit, the charisma, the charismata, the, the gifts of the Spirit can be immediate impartations to people that open themselves up, Lord, I just want more of you. And boy, God can do incredible things. But not so with fruit. You, don't, you, you can't say, I want patience and I want it right now. <laughs> doesn't work that way. But you can surrender to the Lord and these indicators, these birthings, these results over the long haul, there's nothing more beautiful than a seasoned servant who is faithful and God's fruit is brought to bear on their lives. So let, let's pray to that end right now. Heavenly Father, as we close out not just this session, but these 10 weeks in which we've really been focusing upon ways and methods to pray. I can't think of a better way than to ask you, Lord, would you be so gracious as to allow the fruit of the Spirit to be manifest in each one of us? We, we do not want the fruit of worldliness in our lives. I mean, I think that goes without saying. I wish I could say that I've, I don't ever have any of those things of the world. I, they're all gone. But you would know that's not true. Every single day, I have to discipline myself to wait before you and to be in your word and in prayer. My hope is that for each one of us, over the long haul, that people will start to notice, you know, that's love in him. That's patience in her. I just saw joy in her heart. I just, I just noticed that long suffering in the way he is being faithful, no matter what he's standing up against. We think it would be wonderful for all of us to exhibit self-control. And I, I do pray this, Lord. I think that if there's one dominant fruit, though this is not an exhaustive list, but if each of us could have love, if we could have, if we could have love, true, genuine love, then I believe a lot of the other fruit will follow. So give us that love we pray for you love for one another love for our world love for our city a true compassion oh god let the fruit of the spirit be evidence in our lives we pray in the name of jesus everyone says amen amen, amen. 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 god bless you all <laughs>